reveals how the career of the crash test dummy has saved thousands of lives. But behind the glory lies a disturbing and sometimes macabre life story. Test dummy, patron saint of the motorist, a potent symbol of safety in an age of risk. He endures countless violent assaults to help protect our soft, vulnerable bodies, and has become a modern icon, leaving the sterile environment of the lab to enter the world at large. As with any star, we see only the public image. Behind his blank-faced innocence lie dark secrets in a strange and gruesome past. Welcome to the secret life of the crash test dummy. I'm swimming up ahead and you try to make it look as much like a person as you can. You take off all the seams pick up all the flash, like here we have a high seam, and I sand it down to make it look nice and smooth, and it'll clean it all up, and uh, be nice and smooth just like your face. Everybody gets their favorite parts that they like to do. Vanessa, she likes doing the butts. I like working on the heads and uh, feet and chest. When I first come here, I found it kind of morbid with body parts all over the place, and then after a while, it's like no big deal, you know, but at first it was kind of morbid. Bringing a fully formed dummy into the world is an expensive business. A grown adult weighing in at 168 pounds and standing 5 foot 9 inches tall cost about $100,000. He has over 300 individually engineered parts and every detail of his physiology is controlled by law. From the foam in his flesh to the steel in his ribs, even down to his ethnically neutral skin tone. No new car is allowed on the road until the dummy has given it his thumbs up. He is perhaps the closest relative of the human. Once the dummy has left the factory, he enters a dangerous world. Technological kamikaze. His is a mechanical ballet of destruction, at once brutal and beautiful. The crash test dummy has not always been such a well known figure. He began his career shrouded in mystery in the deserts of New Mexico. Here, a strange brew of Cold War paranoia and scientific experimentation came to a head in 1947. The Air Force claimed they discovered the crashed remains of a flying saucer. The episode entered UFO folklore as the Roswell incident. All the newspapers west of Chicago had a headline that we had captured a flying saucer. The R report 
reports that there were bodies involved, alien beings of some, some form. Anywhere from three to five. Descriptions of three and a half to five feet tall, large heads, big eyes, no ears as we know them, although they had orifices on the side of their, their head, a small nose, a slit for a mouth, long arms, four fingers. Why would they come to New Mexico? I think one of the key factors to me, 100 miles south of Rawson, the first atomic bomb in the history of the world was detonated. We had the B-2 rockets of White Sands being launched out into space. Rocket away! Just perhaps, they were sitting out there looking and saw this taking place and might have wondered what were these people up to. We didn't want people to know what we were doing. In 1997, shortly before the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident, the Air Force came out with a document titled Roswell Incident, colon, Case Closed. And one of the things they claimed in there was that anthropomorphic dummies could have been confused with alien sightings at Roswell in 1947. Crash test dummy had conjured up his first myth. But what was really happening out in the deserts of New Mexico? The truth was as strange as fiction. An Air Force colonel had started up a bizarre top secret aeromedical project. Colonel John Paul Stapp is sort of the father of this business in the sense that he was interested in how to protect air crewmen uh, when they ejected uh, out of an aircraft at high speed. And he didn't know any way to study that other than to subject human volunteers to loading that's very similar. One of the rules of human volunteer testing is you've got to be willing to do it yourself. So uh, he was his own volunteer. Stapp used this high-speed test track for a terrifying series of experiments. He started the countdown. Five, four, then, uh, just two, as he reaches zero, you get this enormous ram against your back and uh, feel totally helpless. You'd be given the biggest kick that could be delivered. Remember, there was the old saying in the army. Don't volunteer. <laughs> and in fact, there were several figures in the early days of this kind of work, before there were dummies, who were doing peculiar things. Several of these people uh, became disabled. Undeterred by these risks, Colonel Stapp pushed human testing to the limit. He was trying to work out the maximum speed at which pilots could safely eject. During a seven-year period, he volunteered for 26 potentially lethal experiments. So Dr. Stapp kept going faster and faster, and finally in December 1954, he hit his uh, fastest speed. According to the newspaper, 632 miles an hour. According to the calculations I made from feet per second, at one point he hit 639. But uh, 
the average would be about 6.32. And he stopped very, very short. Just a matter of a second or less. Stapp's record-breaking run made him the fastest man on Earth. He endured a massive 43 Gs during the deceleration, the equivalent of smashing into a wall at 60 miles an hour. As he said, his eyeballs just about popped out. His eyes started bleeding, and for approximately 10 minutes following his famous run, he could not see, but later in the hospital, his vision started returning. He also sustained blisters all over his body, dust particles impinged upon his skin right through the flight suit he was wearing, and Ray's rather interesting looking welts, which fortunately went away. Stapp's work was getting too dangerous. He had to find a substitute. He needed a replica human. The first bionic men were somewhat Neanderthal. The early dummies were very crude. Uh, they were just uh, masses that were connected to simulate the weight and uh, possibly a little bit of the articulation of the human. Uh, but in many ways, they were just sandbags and, uh, to get the mass uh, and, the, and the shape. Body weight and centers of gravity. With cabin pressure differentials and excess. Stubb decided to replace this rather primeval human replica. He called on the services of an engineer named Sam Alderson. Alderson had been developing artificial limbs to help the thousands of servicemen mutilated during the Second World War. So being involved in the replacement parts for a human, I found it very fascinating to go ahead and duplicate the entire human. The Air Force had a wealth of anthropometric data, which described the height, weight, and build of its servicemen. Alderson used these measurements to create a model of the perfectly average pilot. This is a very old dummy. It should have its 50th birthday very soon, a couple of years. This dummy itself was used for testing ejection seats. Uh, here was a cavity. Within this were instruments that radioed back the data to a ground station. We have duplicated here some, but not all, of the motions of the human. These had to be adjusted so that they would respond uh, to the uh, shocks of ejection. These proto-humans began to replace people in the myriad experiments taking place in New Mexico. Research into ejection seats meant the Air Force now knew how to get pilots safely out of their aircraft. The next problem was getting them back to Earth. They found that if you visualize an axis through your navel, you can rotate around that axis up to 435 revolutions per minute, which is fatal to the human being. So they had to devise some other method, and eventually they did it with dummies, 
and uh, these dummies were would be released at high altitude, and different types of parachutes would be used to test them when they fell out of the balloon. <laughs> One experiment encountered problems over the desert town of Alamogordo. Radio station KALG was playing a musical tune in the FM frequency called Tiger Rag. Unfortunately, one of the harmonic overtones from that radio station exactly matched the release signal for the dummies. <laughs> were released and they came down in their parachute, landing in the drive-in theater. That was the first alien invasion of Alamogordo. Hmm. The crash test dummy had revolutionized the military testing program. Practically every piece of equipment now had to pass through his hands before a human was allowed near it. The dummy had come of age. Finally, it was time for him to leave the wide open spaces of the desert, drawn by the lure of the big city. for the crash test dummy. It was time to leave the desert wastes of New Mexico for the far north of the USA and the vast metropolis of Detroit. But it was to be some time before Motor City welcomed the wandering hero. Colonel Stapp, like the dummy, was moving on from parachute testing. Events closer to the ground had begun to attract his attention. Whilst reviewing Air Force accident statistics, he made an extraordinary discovery. The majority of serious accidents suffered by pilots didn't take place in the air at all, but in the short journeys to and from the airbase that the pilots made in their cars. And the problem wasn't unique to pilots. All over the USA, more and more motorists were meeting their deaths on the roads. There was uh, the realization that the uh, number of people being killed on the highways was uh, growing rapidly as more and more people were driving. And the projections were, if the uh, sales continued, that there'd be very high uh, death rates. Stapp became obsessed with car safety and decided to try out his military mannequins in the driving seat. Cars were a new and alien environment for the dummy, and it was difficult to interpret the results he was getting. Stapp needed to develop a dummy based on actual car crash data from real living subjects. But the tests were far too dangerous for humans, so he embarked on Project Barbecue. Project Barbecue was another project uh, in which pigs were used, hogs, and they were anesthetized so that the pig wouldn't feel anything. After all, the anatomy of a pig is similar to that of some human beings. No names. And the pig would be in the swing seat, and they would see what would happen to the play. The information from the pig could be fed back into the design of the dummy's ribs. 
After you get all done with the test, well, what are you going to do? Turn the pig loose on the range? No, you don't quite want to do that. So you might as well put it to good use so you have a big barbecue. When news of Project Barbecue leaked out, people were horrified, but not primarily through concern for the pigs. Putting safety in the spotlight had shown them for the first time how dangerous driving their cars could be. Whenever you talk about the automobile industry, you're talking big numbers. You're talking enormous profits, enormous sales, many, many billions of dollars. And whenever you have that concentration of money, they're going to move to protect it and maximize their profits, not maximize safety. Under pressure, the Pentagon pulled the plug on STAP's test program. But over the next few years, it became clear that the problem couldn't be ignored forever. In 1966, Congress passed a series of laws making car crash testing a legal requirement. The hunt for the perfect artificial human was officially on, and there was some way to go. When crash test dummies started to be used in the auto industry, they were uh, an adaptation of the military dummies, and uh, they were used initially pretty much for ballast, and then when they were crash tested, they were just in there for weight. But as interest began to uh, accrue in terms of protecting the occupants, uh, questions uh, began to be asked about, uh, well, how realistic are these dummies and can we make measurements that, that might relate to injury? injury criteria and you're going to use the dummy to measure these criteria it can be forces can be accelerations and then these criteria should relate to injury in the human so it might take you know a couple hundred pounds to fracture something in the human and you'd measure that in the dummy and that would predict injury in the human <laughs> autopsy and I remember I had to sit down in the middle of the autopsy just because of you know so many sites that I hadn't observed before 
And I think um, you do get desensitized. What you don't get desensitized to, though, is the respect and, and sort of the research you're doing and the importance of it. It takes a lot of work to prepare a cadaver, or post-mortem human surrogate, as the Americans call them. Following death, there's a number of changes that take place in the body. And one of these that most people are familiar with is rigor mortis. Uh, basically, some chemical changes that make the body very stiff and tense. Uh, however, this wears off after a certain period of time. So it, it'll go through a tense period, and then ultimately it'll relax again. We actually do something that's called exercising a cadaver's joints, where we'll actually move the joints through a full range of motion in order to break up some of this stiffness. We try and replicate the living condition as well as we can. In the cardiovascular system, the heart, the aorta, we actually inject in a fluid. can't really bruise a cadaver, but we put a dye in, and so if there's ruptures of some of the vessels, you'll see that this dye actually stains the tissue and would be similar to what a rupture or, or an approximation of what you get for bruising. Once the corpse has been prepared, measuring instruments are fitted for the test what we would do is we would put instrumentation into the cadaver and this would be various sensors, load cells, uh, accelerometers, strain gauges and these are attached to bone generally so we would actually go in and we would screw or attach with wire these accelerometers and load cells to the bone itself. In cadaver tests like these the dead body gave scientists precise measurements of the forces needed to break bones and rupture blood vessels. You need cadavers to develop dummies. There's a tremendous amount of cadaver research that has gone into developing every component within the dummy. This cadaver test shows some of the problems of reproducing the behavior of the human body in a dummy. At the moment of impact, the neck stretches to try and accommodate the shock. The forces here are so extreme that it can't stretch enough and the neck breaks. This is a very complex behavior for an engineer to reproduce in a crash test dummy. And the neck is just one example. The human body is made up of hundreds of different moving parts and materials. If you look at the human body, it's probably the greatest engineering structure. I just marvel at the complexity and some of the designs, the frictionless joints, and some of the details. It's a very resilient structure. It's an, it's an engineering marvel that's been developed to accommodate loads and forces through everyday life as well as circumstances that hopefully don't happen every day, like a car crash. The perfect dummy would somehow have to replicate the fantastic complexity of the real human body. It makes a big difference whether you hit bone fast or slow, because if you hit it fast, it doesn't have time to accommodate that fast hit as it would do if you hit it slow. And therefore, the speed of impact has a very significant effect on the way that the bone responds. Dummy engineers wrestled with these problems as they tried to perfect their artificial human. By the early 70s, they believed they'd done it. All the developments in design came together in the shape of a single dummy, the Hybrid 3. He is the dummy still in use today, and he remains the only legally recognized dummy of his kind. The movement is pretty good. This range of motion is representative of the actual human. And the movement of the neck is much like ours. And he can twist. It also moves side to side. And every movement that we're doing is registering on the load cell. And we can tell how much force it actually took to move. 
we plug in all the instruments into the data acquisition system, which is the computer for the dummy. We record the information, and then after the crash, we can download this information from the data acquisition system. And he'll let us know how well he did in the crash or how he's feeling afterwards. Every new car has to be driven by the Hybrid 3 before a human is allowed to take the wheel. The car is crashed. The sensors in the dummy send out readings telling the computer the exact force that each part of the dummy has endured. If the readings fall within limits prescribed by law, the car is passed. It can leave the lab and enter the showroom. safer, the march of the dummy continues. One of the feelings that people had about dummies, and they stood for actually the ability uh, to soak up punishment, and, and the ordinary driver found it reassuring that someone had been through that particular mill before he had to go through it. The crash test dummy escaped from the test labs of the car companies into the world at large, becoming a familiar and friendly icon of popular culture. He was given star billing in pop promos and advertising campaigns. Everyone, it seemed, had fallen for the dummy. was he confused with visitors from another planet, nor was he a secret and possibly even sinister tool of the military. He had become the symbol of a caring, risk-free age. He was the human face of technology. In the USA, two crash test dummies called Vince and Larry became national celebrities thanks to a decade-long road safety campaign. At the time, U.S. vote use rate was about 11%, very low. So we wanted to do something in the public service arena to get people's attention to encourage them to wear their safety belts. And they did some research and found out that fear wasn't really a good motivator. People didn't really want to see blood and guts to motivate them to buckle up. Even with their bags, We found that it would actually be a turn-off. So they came up with humor as the way to reach the audience, and Vince and Larry were born. You were right, Vince. Say what? When you hit a wall going 50 and you're not wearing a safety belt, your head will fit in the glove box. We call them icons. They are as well known as Smokey the Bear, Tony the Tiger, and the Pillsbury Doughboy. When you say Vince and Larry, everybody knows exactly who you're talking about. If we'd had half a brain, we'd have buckled up. Hey, Papa Brett, I do have half a brain. But as the dummy gained in popularity, becoming a cult personality around the world, murky secrets were beginning to come to light. the height of his fame amongst the general public. For those in the know, his gloss had already begun to fade.
Despite the blandishments of the advertisers, some serious limitations of the crash test dummy were beginning to emerge. The problem with um, designing around crash test dummies is that we're making uh, the vehicle safe for the crash test dummy and not for the human occupant of that vehicle. In other words, we do an awfully good job of protecting dummies, but not humans. Although scientists had created a whole family of dummies, including women and children, the only dummy required by law to guarantee car safety was based on the average male. The primary crash test dummy is the 50th percentile male. Uh, and that dummy represents the average 5 foot 9, about 160 pound male, uh, and doesn't represent anybody else. But every single safety standard is geared to the average male. So if you're a petite woman of about 4 foot 8 who weighs 100 pounds or a small child, uh, you're not protected. There was one part of the population in particular that suffered from the fact that the legal standards revolved around the so-called 50th percentile male. If you look at where the largest needs are right now in terms of developing dummies, improving dummies, it's certainly in, in terms of ch child dummies. And if you look at some of the big problems that have come up the past couple of years, certainly in the United States, it's been children in airbags, out of position children in close proximity to a deploying airbag. Not only have children failed to be protected, they have actually been killed by these safety devices. More than 80 children have died because of airbags exploding in their faces. One of the problems is that child dummies are merely scaled down versions of adult dummies. In real life, the biological relationship is far more complex. Building a realistic child dummy requires data from real children. Data that can be obtained only from crash tests using children's corpses. If there were child cadaver data available at this time, it would allow us to make a safer dummy. It would allow us to design safer airbag systems. And ultimately, you would see that as a reduction in terms of the number of fatalities that are resulting on the roads. But getting this data is not easy. Scientists at Heidelberg University in Germany carried out a series of experiments using child cadavers in order to obtain this much needed biomechanical information. The result was scandal. German tabloids uncovered details of the experiments, dubbing Dr. Calieris Professor Horror. The outrage led to a public inquiry. The lab was closed down and further experiments on children were halted. The Heidelberg research program was, in car crash terms, a very important program and was providing invaluable research results for the rest of the world. It was a dreadful shame that they got into trouble. It's very important for us to produce information to save lives. We can do it, but we can only do it if you give us the equipment. And in this situation, the equipment is a cadaver. <laughs> Crash test dummy has an insatiable appetite for data from real human beings. Only by building up this data can the dummy develop to fit his changing environment. The nature of cars and car crashes is constantly shifting, and so the dummy must mutate. He must evolve to become more like us. In 
the march of the dummy, it's the survival of the most human. The Hybrid 3 is now more than 25 years old. Some in the road safety community think he could be an endangered species. Because the airbag has come in uh, and restraint system usage is up, the combination of those two devices has changed injury patterns. There are less fatal injuries occurring, and as a result, situations where the uh, uh, the, op the occupant uh, would go immediately to the morgue, they're now going to the emergency room and they're finding now that they're not dead, they have to deal with these uh, very devastating sometimes lower extremity injuries. The types of injury that we're particularly concerned with are not perhaps the commonest, which are injuries just to the edge of the ankle uh, in the foot, but those that cause significant disability and long-term morbidity. This bone down here, the calcaneum, the talus, this bone in the middle of the ankle, and the tibia itself are quite often destroyed in frontal impact in car crashes. These fractures are difficult to repair for us uh, as surgeons. They require long operations, long rehabilitative periods, lots of physiotherapy, and an extraordinarily long time before patients can walk again afterwards. Tests were carried out on amputated legs to analyze these new injuries. Our tests have included tests at speed to look at the way the leg bends at uh, the ankle when it's hit, and the way that force is transmitted through the foot and indeed through these bones that are most often broken and cause such disabling injuries. And the answer to these new problems? Test device for human occupant restraint. The crash test dummy for the 21st century. Thor is the result of nearly 20 years research. He is an altogether more sophisticated creation than earlier dummies. Decade. Let me take the cover off so you can see a little better. This is a part of the dummy we were really very proud of. It's our most recent addition. This is the representation of the human tibia bone from top to bottom. The ankle basically has information designed into it to mimic the motion of the ankle, what we call inversion, eversion, which is this motion, and dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, which is this motion. In addition, we've incorporated this cable coming back to the back of the heel. Um, this represents the load path of the Achilles tendon and is uh, basically activated when the foot is moved in this direction. Thor is much more human than his forebears. The neck is multidirectional. The ribs are angled to give them a more human-like response on impact. The curve of the spine, too, is much closer to that of a human, so the dummy can adopt any seating position. There is a special viscera sac, which mimics the response of the internal organs. Its buttocks even produce a realistic seat print. But Thor might never see the light of day. Because crash test dummies, as a species, are in danger of extinction. They are threatened by a new contender, the virtual human. There's no question that in the very near future, we will have a, a computer human that is better than anything. I think that 10 years from now, we'll have a first-class computer model of the human, 
and we'll be running most of the automobile crashes on the computer. People that are going to be in a frontal crash, approximately two-thirds of them are bracing, so they're tensing, they're pressing on the brake pedal, and obviously we have a great deal of difficulty uh, replicating this in a cadaver specimen. So what we try and do, we've tried various techniques, we've tried external springs, we've tried all sorts of ideas, but we really don't have anything that's successful. And here's where things like computer modeling, for example, you can actually incorporate the musculature into the model. In one sense, the virtual human is a completely new species. Crashes in cyberspace are perfectly repeatable. They don't need real cars, they are safe and clean. But he has inherited one important habit from his ancestors. In Detroit, scientists have once again turned for information to the human corpse. In an effort to reduce the number of head injuries caused by car crashes, they have been modeling the human brain. Essentially, we are looking at actual deformations within the brain and doing extensive modeling work in an effort to come up with, perhaps, a new and improved way of predicting what the potential for head injury in any given situation, specifically crash scenarios, might be. This is one of the primary components of our research. This is a triaxial neutral density accelerometer. More commonly, it's simply a plastic box with some foam in it and three very small acceleration measurement chips. And they are mounted in such a way that we can measure acceleration in three directions that are perpendicular to each other. This means removing the head from a corpse and inserting probes into the brain. The head is then mounted on a crash test rig and impacted. An ultra high speed x-ray camera analyzes the movement of the brain tissue. from the corpse is fed into the computer model. It will help to create the most authentic replica human yet. The crash test dummy is 52 years old and on his deathbed. Passive expression gives no sign of his star-studded existence, nor his darker secret life. For the replica human who has survived a million crashes and saved the lives of thousands, it is finally time to face his own mortality.